Okay. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about neighborhood-based image transformations. So last week, we were talking about pixel-based, which means that um, each pixel had the same transformation applied to it. This week, it is a little bit more of the same, but with additional information from the surrounding pixels. So um, the outline for today's talk is the same as it has been other weeks. So we'll do a quick overview, theory and practicum. The link to these slides um, is here. And Andrea, maybe you could drop that in chat. Our goal today is to introduce neighborhood-based band manipulations or image transformations. So we're going to learn a couple of things today. First, defining kernels, what a kernel is, how to create one, how to apply kernels for image convolution. Uh, it's called convolution. Basically, this means do some math. Um, we use the word convolution in our chapter and in this presentation because that's what Google Earth Engine calls them. Uh, but don't worry, I, had, I hadn't heard of it either before uh, diving into the Google Earth Engine specific language. And then finally, we're going to view a variety of neighborhood-based image transformations. And we have a lot of examples in this chapter as we have in other chapters. Not all of them will be relevant to your work, but some of them will be. And we try to include a broad um, selection uh, in order to provide a lot of help for different students and different workflows. So this chapter assumes that you know how to import images, everything in F1, and do basic image analysis and everything in F2. So as we discussed last week, advanced Im image transformations can be better at detecting subtle changes. And some of the ones we'll talk about today can also help bring to light different information that can help with particularly classifications. So last week we talked about the pixel-based approaches, which is chapter F3.1. This week <clears throat> we're talking about the neighborhood-based approaches. All of these, both last week and this week, are used extensively in future chapters, including F4.5 through 4.9, which are some of the more advanced techniques, as well as in all of the application chapters. They're also really frequently used in the scientific literature, so helpful to know if you're diving in there. So first, what is a neighborhood? Essentially, it is the surrounding pixels to your focal pixel. So pixel-based, I'll try explaining this in a couple of different ways. Hopefully one of them helps you. One of the ways to think about it is that pixel-based image transformations are a special case for neighborhood-based pixel transformations where the neighborhood is zero, right? It's only that fo the focal pixel. So only that pixel has, only information from that pixel is used in the transformation. For neighborhoods, that, that neighborhood or what's called in Google Earth Engine, the kernel can be different sizes, different shapes. The different pixels in it can have different weights. But when we do the transformation for our focal pixel, all of that surrounding information is used to calculate the information for that pixel. And what, how the algorithms work is generally you start, you know, you start in a pixel and then you move to the next pixel and use the neighborhood and you move to the next pixel and use that neighborhood and you move to the next pixel and use that neighborhood. So it's a moving window essentially. So before we dive into the practicum, two quick notes. First, you can access the book scripts in Google Earth Engine through the links throughout the book. If it does not show up, click the refresh button. And second, help for functions is widely available. You can see it in the docs tab here by typing in the name of the function, the question mark, leads to user guides, which you can also search for the function. And finally, don't forget to use things like Stack Exchange. So let's dive into the practicum. The first section that we'll talk about this week is linear convolutions. 
This is a linear combination of pixel values in a neighborhood for the focal pixel. In this section, we'll be kind of focusing on a few different new functions. The first is to create a kernel with the EE kernel family of functions. So there's a number of different types of kernel that you can create. Square creates a square kernel of a given size. There's also Gaussian and a number of other different types of kernels. So we'll then, with that kernel and the image, we will do the calculation or convolve with the image.convolve function. And so we just have a quick example here from the book. Uh, we'll be using NAEP imagery. And you can see that the NAEP imagery actually is very high resolution, so you can see a lot of detail. But if we impose a two meter smoothing, you can see how it becomes a lot. Uh, the, the defined edges of the fields and the road and the road lines and things like that become more smooth. And this is code checkpoint F3.2a if you'd like to follow along at home. So I'm just going to pull this window over here. Go ahead and run the script. All right, so let's walk through what this code does. So the first thing that we're gonna show you how to do is create that kernel. So just to create a square kernel uses the kernel.square function. And of course we can always print to the console so that we can see what that looks like. So if we print a square kernel with a radius of two, you can see every, um, every, every piece of the kernel has the same weight, which is the 0 0.04, and it is of the specified size. So it is two pixels or two meters out from the center pixel. We'll then define our point of interest, pull in the imagery, and display it, which is something we've done many times by now. So now let's look at the smoothing example. This uses that square kernel that we just showed you how to create, which takes as inputs the radius and the units. And now we can use that kernel we just created in order to uh, do the convolution. So we start with the image, we use the convolve function, and we specify that we're using the uniform kernel, that kernel that we just created. And then we can add that layer to the map, and we can see, if we zoom in here, the smoothed image. So you can see how much that smooths the NAEP imagery. Another smoothing tool is Gaussian smoothing. So we can again print that Gaussian kernel so we can see what it what the different weights look like. And unlike that uniform kernel, you can see that this center pixel is weighted highest. And then as you move out from the center, it's weighted lower. So it's kind of a, um, if you think about it a little bit, if the weights are um, like a height, you kind of have a three-dimensional bell curve. So if we then define a square Gaussian kernel of a radius of two meters, and then we use that same convolve function with the NAEP imagery, and then so we take the imagery, convolve with the Gaussian kernel, we create a smooth, Gaussian smoothed image, and we can map that, and we can compare and contrast the different amounts of smoothing and what features are retained versus I'll say smoothed away by the Gaussian versus the uniform smoothing. So you can kind of see just by comparing them that the Gaussian smoothed image doesn't lose quite as much of the edges. So if, you for, if we zoom in to this field right here and we can see this kind of very defined um, step, the smoothed image, I'll just give this a second to load, 
There we go. Um, the smoothed image really blends those two, blends the edges together. Whereas if we look at the Gaussian smoothed image, looks like we're gonna have to wait on that too. Oh man. Oh, I can see this piece is loaded. So the edges are not quite as blended together at quite as far of a distance. And again, that's because of how the weights are in the kernel. So if we move on to the next piece, we can also use, instead of smoothing, we can also use this for edge detection. So we can create a Laplacian kernel and print that as well to see the weights. And here you can see that this center pixel is actually weighted with a negative number. So let's see what that does. Before all of them have been positive, and if anything, the center has been the highest. So if we convolve the image with the Laplacian kernel and then map that, instead of smoothing, anywhere where there's an edge, it pops out. So it has a high value. And remember in Google Earth Engine, black is zero and 255 highest values are white. So the highest values are these edges. So you can see where the field edges come out and then where, so these lines in this field here, if you look, are actually, um, it's, it's from the harvest, right? A combine or something is going over uh, the wheat fields and harvesting. And so they leave these marks. So you can see all of these edges pop out. This is, you, you can think of situations where you might need to know where the edges of an object that is in your image is. And this is a helpful tool for pulling that out, and then you can use this as an image, for example, to feed into your uh, regression or your um, classification. So let's also do an image sharpening example. So this actually uses two Gaussian kernels, and it then computes the difference of them. So we first have a large radius Gaussian kernel, or sorry, we have a, a the uh it's not the radius of the kernel is the same it's remember how i said it was kind of like a three-dimensional bell curve it's how flat or how tall that uh kernel is so it's how heavily weighted the center is so if we then calculate those two Gaussian kernels, and then calculate the difference, we can print that. Nope. Oh. And then we can use that convolved, we can then use that kernel to convolve the image by, uh, and create that sharpening effect. So let's take a look at that sharpening effect. There we go. And this one's a little bit more subtle, but unlike the Laplacian edge detection, where the edges are shown in kind of a completely different color scale, this one retains the same color information, but makes those edges more distinct. So if we compare, oops, the original image with the sharpened image, you can see some of the, it's like turning up the contrast a little bit from a visual perspective. So the next section talks about nonlinear convolutions. So we just finished talking about the linear ones. This is the same idea, same neighborhoods, same idea of focal pixel, everything like that. But instead of linear functions in the neighborhood, we're using nonlinear functions. 
These are generally implemented using the reduce neighborhood function that we've used previously. And it includes things like median for continuous variables and mode for categorical variables, as well as a number of others. All right, so let's run this next piece of code. Let me turn off a number of these that we've already looked at. All right, so the median example is we can use with a uniform kernel. So we already created that. And so here we can see that we use that reduced neighborhood. So um, reduced neighborhood is a, I'll call it a subset. Uh, or a special case for the reduce region function. And it's specifically um, like that function, it requires kind of the where, where do you want me to reduce? And then it requires a function. So what function do you want me to apply across the neighborhood? So we provide it with those two pieces. So the reducer is the median function. And then we say the kernel is the uniform kernel. So that's the neighborhood that we're specifying there. So after that's calculated, we can add that to the map. And so we can see what that does to the image. It's kind of like the smoothing function. But if we compare it to the smoothed image that we first created, it's again, the edges are a lot more distinct. So we can see that it retains a lot more of those edges. And this makes sense because if you think about taking the median number, right? So if we have, um, you know, one, three, and five, it's going to take the three. Or if we have one, three, and 500, it's still going to take that three. So it's taking the median across the neighborhood and it will um, kind of get rid of uh, outliers as well. So uh, this can also be used in addition to doing, you know, performing some smoothing. If you have a lot of noise in your image or something like that, this might be an option. So now let's look at the example with a mode. So we're first, so mode works with categorical variables. And this will create and display a simple two-class image. Um, so this uses the greater than function that we talked about a few weeks ago. So if we turn on the categorical image, we can see that. So this is a simple, um, simple filtering just using uh, the near infrared. So it will pull out vegetation, green vegetation specifically. So if we compute the mode in a five by five neighborhood and display the results, this uses that same approach. So we use the reduce neighborhood function. We specify the reducer, this time it's the mode. And then the kernel is that same uniform kernel. So then we can go ahead and display that. And now if we look at the original greater than uh, two class image with the mode, we can see that it kind of eliminates some of those single pixels. And this also makes sense. It's going to help reduce some noise with a categorical image as well. Because again, if you think about what that mode function is doing in the neighborhood, it's looking at all of the values and it's saying which is the most common. And then it will return that value for the focal pixel. So anytime, for example, if the focal pixel is uh, a black pixel and all the pixels around it are green, it will then become a green pixel after the um, convolution. Morphological processing. This is useful for classification post-processing. Although I will note, it does require some trial and error in order to come up with the 
right combination of filters to use as your post-processing steps. There's kind of no one best way. It's a little art along with your science. So these are all helpful as well for removing stray pixels, reducing noise and improving accuracy for your classifications. And they're basically different combinations of minimum and maximum reducers. So just like we used those median and mode reducers for the nonlinear section, now it's basically going to talk about some minimum and maximum reducers. We'll again start with that thresholded image that we created. So this should again pull out green vegetation as green and everything else as black. And this is just a helpful heuristic for us to explain and expand on these co concepts. So the first example is what's called dilation. And this is essentially taking the maximum. So we'll use the same reduced neighborhood. And this time our reducer is the maximum. We'll also use that uniform kernel and then map that layer. So if we think about that neighborhood again and the focal pixel, this is, I'll say a more intense version of the mode filter that we just saw. So it is instead of taking the mode, which is the most common value, it's taking the maximum value. So here, we can see what that does. So all of the black lines that are from, essentially from the machinery um, in our green field are completely gone. Just to compare quickly, you can see how they just totally disappear. And I'll just do a brief comparison with the mode that we did in the nonlinear. And you can see it's not quite as drastic. So again, when I talk about, you know, your, your trial and error, this is the kind of thing, you know, maybe you need it really drastic. Maybe you want to dial it back. It's kind of all dependent on your question, your region, your input imagery, your output classification, all these kinds of things. So, so that's taking the maximum value. But then we can also do the opposite. We can take the minimum value, and this is what's called erosion. So again, reduce the neighborhood, use the minimum reducer, use the uniform kernel, and we can, there we go. So you can see, instead of having the entire circle filled in with green, instead we see those uh, black, lines become more prominent and the uh, stray pixels of green become disappear that are you know over in this area they disappear with the minimum and again that makes sense remember because our black values are zero and our green values are one after that class of, after that uh, thresholding so of course the minimum is going to make those zero values expand, whereas the maximum reducer would make them be smaller and the areas that are one expand. So you can kind of think about it that way. So you can also combine these minimum and maximum functions or reducers sequentially in that we can what's called open. So this is done by using dilation following erosion. So we start with that uh, minimum or eroded map, and then we open it, we take the maximum. And so we start with the erosion and then we can open it. And so the minimum first kind of makes the black areas more expansive. And then the taking the maximum 
does the opposite. It makes those green areas more expansive. And we can see that if we compare the opened image to the raw categorization, it has actually retained a lot of those green areas as opposed to having them become black, which just the erosion did. But it's also gotten rid of a lot more of these very small areas. So a lot of those, you know, one or two pixel areas has disappeared, but it hasn't lost quite as much of the strong green areas as we saw with the eroded image. So you can also do the opposite. You can start with the maximum and then do a minimum. So now let's take a look at what that does. So if we start with the dilation or the maximum reducer, and then we apply the minimum, we can again see that some of those areas that had become I kind of think of it as puffy, where it's the, the green has expanded, have kind of had, ha, have been contracted again, so that they are not as, um, they are not as far out as they had been into those black regions. And if we compare this with the initial categorical image, one of the things that we can see that it's done a pretty good job of is all of those black lines that were from the machinery have largely disappeared. So, but unlike the dilated image, the, the closed image hasn't overreached those boundaries. So if we compare the closed image with the original, we can see that those boundaries I'll give it another second to load. You can see all of these black holes get filled in, but that initial boundary edge doesn't change as much as it does with the dilation where we can see that it kind of expands in some places beyond that initial, where that initial boundary was. The last section deals with texture, and this is actually one of my favorites. It has a lot of uses, including for things like crop detection, or differentiating forest canopies based on their texture or their, their roughness. If you think about a forest, for looking at a forest from above, different types of forests, different types of trees have different uh, topography. So if a lot of deciduous trees might be more rounded, coniferous trees might be more pointed. If we think about looking, thinking about the crop detection side, one of the things that texture gets used for is detecting palm crops because the palm trees are planted in grids such that their uh, canopies form very distinctive patterns. Some of these texture approaches use the reduce region function and others have specialized functions in Google Earth Engine just for them. So these include entropy and the GLCM textures. So Let's dive in and take a look at them. This is the F3.2D checkpoint. And we'll just go ahead and start with that true color image. <clears throat> 
One of the first examples of texture is simply standard deviation. So this helps to pull out, if you have a high standard deviation, you can think about that. If you think about your, your neighborhood of pixels and the value in each of those pixels, lay them out and then take the stand, you know, you can take the mean of them, you can take the standard deviation of them. If those pixels are all very similar, you're gonna have a small standard deviation. If those pixels are very different, you're gonna have a large standard deviation. Places where you might have a large standard deviation include transition areas. Whereas places where you're likely to have small standard deviations are within a field of the same type. So we can compute the standard deviation using a square kernel. So we're creating a big kernel. We called it big kernel. It's a seven meter radius instead of a two meter radius that we used previously. And then we use the reduced neighborhood function again with the standard deviation reducer and that big kernel. So then if we add that layer, we can see that areas of transition have high standard deviations and those end up being the edges of the field, which is unsurprising. So this is kind of another method of edge detection. Next, we'll dive into entropy. So entropy currently only works in Google Earth Engine on integers. So the first thing we do is create an integer version of the NAPE image. And we simply use the INT function. And that simply converts your band values from having you know, a whole bunch of decimal places to being an integer. So now we, can we compute the entropy. And this is one that has a specific function for it. So from the integer NAPE, we select the near infrared band, and then we run the entropy function using the big kernel. We add that to the map and comparing again with the uh, true color image, we can see that for the near infrared band, which again is going to have high values generally where there are is green vegetation and lower values in other locations. We can see that the entropy is high or it's white in areas that don't have some of that similar green areas. So for example, this field here, we see we have high entropy in areas that don't have that same green field. And we can also see just by looking at it, it's pulling out the texture of some of those machine lines from the irrigation machines. Also pulling out some of those lines from where the harvest has happened. It's also pulling out, interestingly, you can see this is a wash line. This is a basically where there's water um, that drains off. And you can see that those are also pulled out. A third type of texture is GLCM. And GLCM uses the gray scale bands. to evaluate how similar adjacent pixels are. And then it calculates texture, matrix, texture metrics based on that. There's a pretty detailed explanation in the text of this. And there's actually a lot of really great resources online for looking at how specifically gray level co-occurrence matrices are calculated. That's a little bit outside of the scope of this lesson. We're just kind of the, the key thing to understand is that it's evaluating how similar those adjacent pixels are in their 
um, in, and then using that information to calculate the texture metrics. So if we look at GLCM, this is another one where there's a specific function for it. And the Google Earth Engine information for this function is quite good. Um, I recommend looking into it if you're thinking about using this function. So we can use that integer nape that we created, and then we call it the GLCM texture. And it will create a whole bunch of different texture metrics. And I think, yes, yeah, so we print these to see all of the different texture metrics that it provides. So the seven is the size. So for each band, it's calculating 18 different metrics. So all of these are different metrics. The Google Earth Engine help will tell you about that. So here's the green band, blue band, and then the near infrared band. So if we display the contrast, this will basically show where there's high levels of contrast in each of these bands. So areas that have high levels of contrast for the red band will show up as very red, et cetera, et cetera. So we can again see that we have some edge detection type results which is what we would expect as these bands have high levels of contrast at the edges and not so much in the center. And where we see this white, it means that there is high levels of contrast across all of the different bands. Where we see black, it means that there's low amounts of contrast over all of these bands. You can also do this with any of the other 18 different uh, calculated um, texture metrics for the GLCM. And again, the Google Earth Engine help files has some good information about what each of these is and how it's calculated. The next example is Erie C. Oops. And this is a spatial statistic. Uh, so it's similar to Moran's eye. Um, and both of these can be used to evaluate texture, although they're frequently used for spatial autocorrelation. Oops. So this one's significantly more complex because there's not a good built-in function for it. And so essentially what we're doing is calculating it using a combination of the weights of a custom kernel and some, some functions applied to that kernel. So the book text has some more detail, but I just wanna run through quickly kind of what this what we're doing here. And I highly also recommend using the print function after different ones of these steps so you can see what each step sequentially is doing. So the first part of this is creating first a list and then a center list for our to specify that the center of the kernel should be zero. So a zero weight. We then assemble this, each of these lists, which can be thought of as rows in the 
um, in that neighborhood. If we think of our neighborhood set of pixels as a matrix, that's essentially what our weight matrix is. So we can then use, we can create that matrix as a list of lists, because again, Google Earth Engine uses arrays for matrices. We talked about those a lot more, I think it was last week or two weeks ago. And those arrays are very helpful. Uh, an understanding of arrays is very helpful for also thinking about the neighborhoods. But we assemble these lists into a nine by nine kernel. So each of each of our defined lists is nine has has nine numbers in it. And then we assemble these lists nine times in order to create a nine by nine array or matrix. And again, that center list is our center list. So we will have at the output of this, if you print lists, it will show you a matrix where all of the values are one except for the center, which is a zero. So we now create a kernel. And the non-zero weights will represent the spatial neighborhood. So we can create custom kernels using the kernel fixed function. And if you want to know, for example, what the different arguments are, remember that you can always go to docs and, for example, do kernel dot, oops, dot fixed. And you will see the information about that function pops up. And we see here that the arguments are width, height, weights, which is that list of lists that we just created. The 2D list is, again, an, a matrix. And then the next step uses the max among the bands as the input. So we create an image. We reduce across bands. Remember, reducers must reduce across something so they can reduce across space, which is what the reduce neighborhood function does, or they can reduce across bands. They can also reduce across time, but that's in future chapters. So we use that max reducer across the bands. And then we convert the neighborhood into multiple bands and then use a whole bunch of different um, mathematical functions to compute the local Geary C. So this is a measure of spatial association. And then we can map that. Again, functions occur from left to right. And you can pull out them one by one if you're more interested in this. It's really just calculating um, Gary C and we don't need to dive too much into that. So if we look at the output of this, it's again, doing a good job of pulling out those areas of transformation or change between fields. It's also pulling out some of those washes. So here, but they're a lot more faint. And it's pulling out a lot of those farm boundaries or field boundaries, my apologies. So I also recommend if you're interested in kind of thinking more about texture, the this is just the satellite imagery, right? So we've been looking at a place in Eastern Washington that grows a lot of wheat. It has a very distinct kind of landscape. If we look somewhere else, like say um, up in the mountains of British Columbia, we're going to see that we have a lot of different types of textures. So here there's different forests and different forest heights and you know different areas that have been logged, right? So the, these are all logging roads and the bare areas are areas that have been logged. These areas are older forest. These are younger forest. So we could, for example, use texture here 
to pull out these different ages of forest. So there's a lot of different applications and I encourage you to think about what the topography of your area of interest is and think about which of these might be helpful. And sometimes the best way to do that is by calculating them.